A very good morning to you. I'm Howard Feldman. This is the Synthesis Sunday podcast. It is January the 17th. I'm Howard Feldman, and I'm going to be speaking very quickly today for two reasons. The first reason is that I was told on Friday uh, by somebody that they watch these podcasts at, I think it's 1.25 speed. Well, try that now, hero. The other reason that I'm going to be talking quite quickly today is because we were inundated. We have received hundreds upon hundreds of questions from you, and I do appreciate that. Thank you for every, to everybody for taking the time. We are going to try and get through as many of them as possible. We've group them. So if I don't ask you a specific question, I hope that I'll cover it in some of the sections that uh, or some of the other questions that I ask. Please don't forget to subscribe. A lot of people are asking me where they can reach or where they can access these podcasts. Please subscribe so that you have access to all of the new podcasts that we put out. We do this every Sunday. And unless, uh, if, unless something happens that's urgent during the week, you can rely on us coming to you every Sunday uh, afternoon around this time. Dr. Anton Marburg, good morning. You look a little bit more relaxed today. Uh, I don't know if that's because things are a little bit better or because you're actually having a rare weekend at home. So how is currently the latter? I'm at home enjoying a weekend with my family and actually not working this weekend, thank God. There are currently 94,969,053 cases worldwide with 2,031,317 deaths and 67 million cases resolved. The United States has 24 million cases with 405,000 deaths, and South Africa has 1,325,659 cases with 36,851 deaths and 13,973 new cases in the last 24 hours. The hospitals in Gauteng are inundated with 5,115 cases admitted into hospital in Gauteng with 1,041 cases of COVID-19 in ICU and 449 of those cases currently ventilated. The cases that you're seeing, or do you assume that it's all the new variant or does it not matter? So essentially it doesn't matter to us whether it's a new variant or the old variant. The presentation, the symptomatology is exactly the same. The only difference with the new variant is it's highly and far more contagious and more transmissible, up to 70% more transmissible, but the treatment is the same. The other thing we're seeing is that it's affecting a lot of younger people, people over the age of 45, over the age of 50, more so than it did during the first wave, and that's what matters in the difference of the variants. With regards to vaccines, we'll chat about later, there also might be some controversies with regarding the variants. Right. And uh, I know that we are told that it's uh, much more transmissible, but it's not the sympt symptomatically, it's not more serious. It's not quite what you're seeing, even though it's only anecdotal. Am I right? Right. So, I mean, what we're seeing in our hospitals is a far more serious disease. The academics are saying that it's definitely not a more serious disease, but the patients we're seeing in ICU are getting sicker quicker and are much more critical than we saw during the first wave. So yes, it is anecdotal. Yes, it is what I'm seeing in my hospital and what a lot of my colleagues are seeing all around, but this is a subsection of patients only. We're talking about hospital patients. We're not talking about patients out of hospital. Right. Uh, let's just talk about, uh, get this one out the way because it's a very, uh, I, we, I, I can't tell you how many questions I'm getting around ivermectin, both as a uh, prophylaxis as prevention, as well as a possible treatment. Where is South Africa um, in, uh, in this regard? Where are you in this regard? What are your thoughts and uh, what are you seeing? So there's no change in the South African policy regarding ivermectin. It is still illegal to prescribe ivermectin. SAPRA and the Ministerial Committee have all advised against prescribing ivermectin. There's some new um, information that's come to light this week that's saying that the national bodies overseas are neither for nor against the prescribing of the drug. Now, that's a very dangerous statement to make because it's very different to something like the corticosteroids like dexamethasone, where everyone is for the use of it. Here, there's not enough information to say that it is safe or it's unsafe, and we don't want to deal with that variable. We want safe or, or unsafe. We need to know exactly what we're dealing with so we can prescribe this without having side effects or without having ramifications of the drug. It can take you straight back to the hydroxychloroquine debate where there were hundreds of people saying how safe it was and how effective it was, and we know that it's not. So we have to wait for reliable, peer-reviewed data that can give us the answers to say that it is safe to use 
and more importantly being safe, it is highly effective in treating the replication and preventing the replication of this virus. So, so far in terms of prophylaxis, we are still staying with the basic uh, vitamin regime. And more important than that is the non-pharmaceutical interventions, the hand washing, the social distancing, and the wearing masks above your nose. Mm -hmm. And I know that we do this every time, but we still have a number of questions, people asking, give us the vitamins we should be taking and the quantities that we should be taking as a prevention. So I think in general, everyone should be taking a, a well-rounded vitamin if they're not sick. Once you get sick, then we go on to the vitamin concoction. And that consists of vitamin C, 500 milligrams, one tablet three times a day. This, nice is, and, this is if you're not sick. This is if you are sick. If you are diagnosed with it, if you are diagnosed with COVID, then this is the, the concoction or this is the, the prescription okay. that you should follow. So it's vitamin C, 500 milligrams, one tablet three times a day. It's niacin, about 50 milligrams to 100 milligrams, otherwise also nicotinamide. There's zinc, which is 25 to 50 milligrams a day. And there's calciferol, which is actually unavailable at the moment. And that is 50,000 units a week, or you can use 4,000 international units a day. And then things like thiamine, you can get combination medications like Neurobion, which is a combination of thiamine and other vitamins. So there are other vitamins and these are for a seven day period. If you are not sick, you can take your general vitamins which contain your vitamin C, your zinc, your thiamine in much lower doses as a general thing like a Centrum or any of these uh, pharmatons or vitathons that contain most of these vitamins. All right. So that is what we should be doing just to remain, just to remain safe. The, uh, the vaccine. Let's just talk about what we're seeing. Uh, we know other parts of the world are, are Israel in particular is on their second dose. Um, that said, I just read this morning that uh, Chief Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Lau has been diagnosed with COVID-19 after his second dose. Uh, take us through what you're seeing in terms of vaccines. So I think you've got to remember that a lot of vaccines are two injections, two, two doses. Okay? There's the first injection, which is a trigger for an initial immune response to, to certain proteins produced by the virus. And then there's a second injection, which is three weeks to four weeks later, which calls the immune system's memory cells into play and into action. Now, very similarly, like the flu in vaccine, just because you've had the flu vaccine doesn't mean you're going to not get flu. It's actually in contrary to that. What it does is dampens the response that you get from the flu. So that you get a much better response from the, your immunity system that fights off the flu and you get a much more dampened flu or a much less severe flu. And so be it the same with Rabbi Lau, having had the two vaccines, the corona that he's got now, or the, I don't think, I don't know if he's got COVID-19 or he's got SARS-CoV-2, I'm sure of that, but whatever he's got now is much less than he would have had, God forbid, if he had not have had the vaccines. Right, so uh, it does help. Do we know yet if it stops the transmissibility of the disease? We don't know yet. We do know that it decreases the symptoms and the infectiousness rate, but we don't know if it stops the, the actual transmission. And that's why it's so important that even if you've had the vaccine, you still can transmit it to other people if you are around them, etc. So you've still got to be very careful. Where is South Africa in terms of the vaccine procurement? So the, the Department of Health and the government are sending out all uh, tweets about the fact that they are waiting to vaccinate the healthcare workers. We are still waiting to hear when this is going to happen. They apparently got enough vaccines for 1.2 million people. They've now sent out a schedule of who will be next after that, the essential workers, um, the people who have comorbidities, the people over the age of 65, which consists of another up to few million people and then thereafter the other the remain of the people and we're looking at about vaccines for over 40 million people mm. at the moment we know where uh, because none of it has been released to to the public yet but apparently it's going to be happening in the next few weeks all right let's hope charles wants to know how does life change for older people after they're vaccinated can they mix freely with each other safely or do they need to still isolate until there's herd immunity so we still have to isolate until there's herd immunity as I said, as you just correctly said from that article about uh, Rabbi Lau, which is in the Jerusalem mm. Post today, that you still can get sick from it, albeit not as sick, you still can transmit it and you can still get sick from it. And so until we've reached herd immunity, we still have to use protective mechanisms.
All right. Let's just talk about treatments. Uh, we've, we've spoken about ivermectin. Belinda says, what are your thoughts about therapeutic bronchoscopy? You're going to have to pronounce it for me as one of the solutions for COVID-19. Apparently, this was on carte blanche. I didn't see it. What, what is that? So this is a, what we call a bronchoscopy, where you take a tube and you insert it down the bronch the, the bronchi of the lungs, okay? It's a extremely dangerous procedure where the person is already what we call hypoxic. In other words, they've got low oxygen levels and you're now taking a tube, sticking it down their airways and decreasing the oxygen levels further. It aerosolizes the virus. In other words, it makes the virus more spreadable and more um, dangerous to the healthcare workers that are actually, even though they're wearing PPE. And it's not the be all and end all. In fact, the South African Thoracic Society put out a message to say that this is not a treatment for COVID-19. In a very, very small percentage of patients that have got what we call mucus plugs, it does help, but it is not a treatment option for COVID-19 and is not recognized as one of the treatments. So it's all nice and it's very nice to see these things on carte blanche, but this is not effective treatment and this does not cure COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2. You've got to be very careful with that. It's not a therapeutic option. Oh, please just explain, what you, you, this is the second time you've referred to it. It does not cure COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2. Just explain what, what's the distinction. It's very similar to HIV and AIDS. Okay, Just because you've got HIV doesn't mean you've got AIDS. Once your CD4 count drops below 200, or you've got other stage four types of things of, of related to the HIV, then it's considered AIDS. So be it with SARS-CoV-2. You might be infected with the SARS-CoV-2, doesn't mean you've got COVID-19. Once you become hypoxic and you get all the other manifestations or the other, other sort of click of the whole illness, then we diagnose as COVID-19. So the two are not interchangeable. So yes, once you've got COVID-19, you've got SARS-CoV-2, but once you've got SARS-CoV-2, the virus doesn't necessarily mean you've got COVID-19. It means that you can be asymptomatic without any major symptoms and just have had the virus. And does that mean you can still spread it? Is that what we mean by you can not pre-symptomatic people, but asymptomatic people? You can still spread. No, it's, it's got nothing to do. It can be some asymptomatic or symptomatic or pre-symptomatic. It depends how you evolve with the virus into the next stage. In other words, if you go to stage two, three, four of the things, does it go from the prodromal phase to the respiratory phase, the viremic phase, the hypoxic phase, all those different phases of the virus where it becomes COVID-19? Is there any practical difference for somebody who gets that diagnosis? I mean, they're still going to be isolating. They're going to go on to that regime. Practically, uh, for, for the so lay there person, is a practical does it difference, make a difference? Yeah. Hmm? Because a lot of people who might have SARS-CoV-2 are asymptomatic and don't realize that they've got it. That's the only difference. Right. Okay. So it's, it's, it's from, a, from a precautionary perspective. Suzanne wants to know, just going back to the vaccines, um, is it possible that uh, Dr. Anton please comments on the vaccinations of pregnant and lactating women? So there's not enough studies out at the moment to say whether or not it's safe for pregnant and lactating women. Remember, as I've said before, they don't do the studies on pregnant and lactating women for obvious mm. reasons, because you've got a fetus to, to, to be careful of and you've got the woman herself to be careful of. So we've got to wait for further studies to see the safety regarding this. Right. Um, let's just talk as well about, uh, you mentioned that this new variant is affecting younger people. Are we seeing children becoming ill with it? We are seeing children becoming ill with it. We are seeing children as asymptomatic carriers transferring the virus to other people. Uh, if you look at hospitals like Barry Guarneth, we used to have empty COVID wards. They've now got multiple numbers of children in the wards that are sick. And yes, they aren't as sick as the adults, thank God, but they still get very sick. There's the MIS-C, which is the multi-inflammatory syndrome in children. We know it's very similar to the Kawasaki, lark fever yeah. type syndrome that children get. So it is more prevalent now than it was during the first wave. And this is most likely due to this new variant. Right. Well, uh, Leanne says, uh, given the new variant uh, present uh, with, uh, with, uh, and the fact that it might affect children, um, why, does it, why has it been deemed okay for nursery schools um, to return to, uh, to school? Look, let's take it as a blanket thing and let's call it schools per se. I think the fact that the government has said that there's been no schooling until the 15th of February is a very good idea. I think what many of the private schools are doing is they're doing an orientation for one or two days this coming week in strict, regulated, enforced environments 
where the kids are outside, the teachers are outside, the teachers are wearing their mask, their visors, the kids are socially distanced. They're going to stagger the times the kids come there. So there's different times, there's smaller groups of people around there. That's safe to do. I wouldn't do anything else than that. I wouldn't be happy for my own children to go back to school after that until we see that there's a downward trend or plateau in the numbers of virus. We know in the community the numbers are extremely high. Hatsola have mentioned that the numbers in the community are growing rapidly. And we're also hearing a lot of people that haven't joined wellness programs because they're worried that their children won't be able to go back to school. So the numbers are striking. The numbers are very high. And we've got to be very careful. So, which, which is interesting because you've had a very, very um, firm view until recently that schools are very safe places and kids should go back. Has that sh has your thinking shifted in this regard? So it, it has shifted. It definitely has shifted with this new variant. And right now, we've got a duty not only to protect our children but to protect the teachers, and we've also got a duty to protect our parents and the grandparents because if the mm. children are asymptomatic and they transfer the virus to their, to their parents or their grandparents, there's big trouble. We're hoping now with the lockdown, and if people do it effectively and responsibly and safely, we can get people back to school, back to what we'll do, back to the bubbles where it can be sun safely. Once the peak and the plateau started coming down, I believe it will be safe again for everybody to go back to school because we do know that it's a very safe environment. Yeah. But while it's out there at such high levels and in yeah. such high degrees in the community, we've got to be much safer and we've got to be much more responsible. Mandy asks a question that I think a lot of us are feeling and certainly feeling it in the last uh, two weeks or so. She says, uh, what is the likelihood of not catching the virus at all? It's starting to feel like it's a matter of when, not if. And, and, and I know that, yes, I'm a hypochondriac, but, but I do feel it's almost closing in at the moment. Look, the, the, the numbers are extremely high. There are plenty of people getting the virus. And once again, this is also now post the surge from holiday. You've got to understand that people are on holiday. People drop their guard. People are saying to us, I just went to a New Year's party with 15 mm -hmm. friends. We were outside. So why would I get the virus? So it's about the fact that people's behavior, if people's behavior change and people are more responsible and people are more careful and less selfish, then there's less chance of you getting the virus. It doesn't mean you're going to get the virus. You have to be careful. You have to follow all the rules. You have to have no major play dates. You have to have follow the non-pharmaceutical interventions. You have to not socialize to actually prevent us going into a third wave. We're very worried about a third wave in the winter months, you know, very similar to the, the Spanish flu. And hopefully if we get this lockdown, this, this level three lockdown right now, by the middle of February, Hopefully we can try and prevent a third wave. Well, it's interesting because uh, Lindy asks the question, should it be mandatory to tell if you are COVID positive? Surely uh, we should remove, the, there shouldn't be a stigma and you should uh, tell. I know that uh, in workplaces, the, the health officers um, have to report it and it, it is mandatory in, in workplaces to inform your employer. But uh, shouldn't it be the case in any event, letting your schools know, letting people around you know what the story is. You see, the stigma comes, especially with the schools. Parents are scared to tell that they're positive because their children won't be able to go to school and their children lose out and their children then are, are, are going behind in their academic system. You know, in the private schools, it's much easier because you've got the Zoom links and you can follow on from that point of view. Mm, mm. But unfortunately, it's not a disease that we we'll have to make identifiable if you are positive, how, albeit it should be so we can protect each other. Right, uh, absolutely. And, uh, and a few people asking about antibodies. If they had the earlier variant or, or the first, uh, during the first wave, are they protected at all from the second, from this new variant? So remember there are multiple studies showing that the antibodies can last from three to six months. And there's something called an antibody title, which you can actually measure the amount of antibody you've got in your system. And as the weeks go by, that title, that amount of antibody decreases quite significantly. Mm. Now, we don't know that if you protect in the first bout, let's say in March or April last year, if you had it now in January this year, do you have effective memory cells against the new variant? Are you able to transmit? Are you able to spread it? The answer potentially you are able to spread it and you are able to get it again. 
So we would say rather refrain and be careful and stay away from people and isolate or quarantine if you come in contact with other people. Right. So uh, Matt as well asking that question. He's also uh, asking if you think the variant uh, or the, the current vaccines uh, are going to be effective against the new variant. We, 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 we mentioned it, but we didn't really talk about this earlier. Yeah. So, so I think that from Pfizer's point of view, Moderna's point of view, they believe that the new vaccine will be effective against the N501Y.2 uh, variant of South Africa, as well as the B117 variant from the United Kingdom. They do believe it. There are other mutations that they're looking into, the E mutation that they're looking into to see if that will be um, sort of work against it. But Prof Shabir Modi seems to think that you will have some protection against even that mutation from the virus, from the vaccines. So we we hopeful and we we know that they're doing many studies and that the AstraZeneca trial was done um, on some members in South Africa. So we're hoping when that one comes here that it will be effective against the new variant. You know, at the end of the day, it's mobilizing, as Prof Shabir Modi says, it's mobilizing a group of soldiers against a fight in a battle. And yes, half of the battle, the battalion is taken out, but you still got the other half of the soldiers to fight the battle. So you do, do still have some sort of immunity against these things. Mm-hmm. And uh, Gary, also, uh, Gary also asking about that is uh, if the person's had the first variant, uh, the is it possible that they might even get the second one worse because they may be compromised or would they get it the same? Would they have a reduced chance of getting it? Do we know? So I don't think having had the first variant makes you more susceptible to getting the second variant. And I don't think if you've had the first variant, you'll get it worse if you get the second variant. It's all due to how badly you get it and to how bad the virus replication is and what the degree of your affectation is. And uh, a few people asking, should they be going back to sanitizing groceries when they bring them home? Personal decision, I don't. Right. So you don't uh, you don't think it's uh, you don't think it's necessary. I, I don't all. think it's entirely necessary. Wash your hands when you come home from the shops. Wash your hands when you get into your car. Keep a sanitizer with you in the shops. Do those mechanisms. Right. Okay. A couple more questions, and this I found quite interesting. A few people asking uh, and uh, about the about uh, communication with doctors in hospital. We spoke about that last week, how difficult it is for the hospitals. Uh, They're not allowing other people in, obviously. That places a tremendous burden on doctors and on staff and communicating with families. Just give us some advice around this because more and more people, unfortunately, are impacted by this. What can the families expect? What should they expect? You know, I think as a doctor, we've got an adage that says, primum non nocera, first do no harm. And our most important adage is to treat our patients first. We've got to make sure our patients are well. We've got to make sure we can treat them properly. We now take a situation where we're in a pandemic, where we're in crisis situation, where we're in PPE for multiple hours of a day. It is very difficult when you've got more than 40 or 50 patients in the ward to speak to every family member. A lot of the time, The family members have got their cell phones with them and they are able to speak to their own family and transmit or relay the messages to them. If there's a problem, hospitals have got liaison officers that can liaise with family members. So phone the hospital, ask for the liaison officer to try and deal with the family member or see if you need to get further information. If your relative is extremely ill on the ventilator in ICU, most of the time, the doctor will make a plan to give you an update, whether it's not himself personally through the liaison or through one of his personal assistants, because that's in a dire situation and the decisions always have to be made in that situation. So please just have some patience with the doctors. They're under tremendous strain and pressure. They're working 25 hours a day. They are sleep deprived. So understand that it's not like it was a year and a half ago when you had time to sit and chat to everybody and bring families into your office. This is a war zone. We need to treat it like a war zone and we need to be empathetic and understand what the doctors are going through. They are not trying not to answer your questions. They are just too stressed and pressured to have to phone every single family member. Mm -hmm. If somebody is diagnosed with COVID-19, they're at home, um, Hatsola, Discovery, a a number of organizations have offered oxometers. Um, If if, uh, somebody isn't connected with with one of those organizations, they buy buy their own. what What should they look out for? When should they call for help 
um, if, they, if they're following their, their SACs? So I think every person who's unwell should be in contact with some doctor, whether it's a GP, whether it's a specialist. The GPs are extremely well versed in, in understanding what's going on. They run a lot of home programs. They do a lot of telemedicine. They're controlling their patients. They're helping the flow of, of patients not having to go to hospital. So if you're in trouble, phone your GP. They will advise you what to do. They can tell you, they generally know what your oxygen levels are more or less. And they say, to you, if your oxygen levels drop below 90% and you're unwell, you might need to go to hospital or they might need to start other treatment. But communicate with your general practitioners. They're there to help you. They're a force to be reckoned with in this, in this, in this province of Gauteng. I'm sure all over the country. But I know we've got a GP forum in Gauteng that sticks together, works together, and is really on top of it. And they've got the, 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 the ducks in a row. Um, and uh, Vivian wants to know, what is the likelihood of getting a false positive? Let's just talk about false negatives and positives, in fact. Look, you can get a false positive, you can get a false negative. There's no, there's no doubt about it, especially with the rapid antigen test. You can get many, many false results. But once you get a positive result, regardless of that result, you have to treat that result as being positive. It does not matter because you're not going to generally go and test two or three days later. So some tests do, do pick up uh, results when they aren't there, but you've also got to put the clinical context into, into the whole picture. Mm. And you've got to say that if you get a positive result and you've been in contact with somebody or somebody in the house is sick, and that, that actually brings me to another really important yeah. statement. You know, when, when you're at home and let's say you get sick, God forbid, and then four days later, your spouse gets sick and another four days later, your child gets sick. What people are doing is they're saying from the first person who got sick after the 10 days, they're going out into open. And that I believe is fundamentally wrong. I think that you've got to wait for the last person in the house to get over that 10 day period before you can go out the house unless you've isolated or quarantined from them completely. So it's very important. You wait for the last person in the house who's been sick to get through their whole quarantine period, asymptomatic, 72 hours of no symptoms before you yourself can leave the house with feeling that you won't be actually able to spread the virus to other people. Let's just talk about what those symptoms are, because we know that, that there are certain symptoms that have been lingering for months for people. So what would those symptoms be from which time you would count the 72 hours? Look, some people are going to remain in oxygen for many months, many weeks. That's not a symptom if you remain in oxygen. The symptoms are the fever, the gastrointestinal symptoms, the headache, the, the loss of appetite. If you've got multiple symptoms together, especially the fever, then you're still considered contagious for that 72 hour period. If you've got a 72 hour period with no fever, minimal cough, no shortness of breath, then you can say that you are symptom free for, for 72 hours. But that, but that is um, the prerequisite there is that it's still the 10 days, am I right? It's still the 10 days. You have to do the 10 days, yeah. Right. Okay, so because I think that's, uh, that's obviously important. Sarah Joss uh, want, and family want to know, why is flying an issue if uh, you have a visor, a mask, sanitize your seat, et cetera? Um, yeah. yeah, that's a good question. Uh, and, I, and I'll tell you why it's a good question. is because throughout the last few weeks, multiple people have been getting on planes knowing that they are positive and not disclosing it to people and through that way spreading the virus. Yes, most people who wear masks and visors are more diligent and, and probably more safer. And because of the HEPA faults in the plane, they're probably all more safer. But mm -hmm. sometimes people who are wearing the mask and visors may lift the visor up or may bring the mask down. And the person next to you coughs into your face. You, you're going to get the spread of that virus. So it's unfortunate due to people's behavior, due to the fact that people aren't honest. People don't tell the truth. The fact is they want to get home, so they'd rather not drive home. They'll get on the airplane. And unfortunately, as always, the good always have to suffer with the bad. So mm. Karen wearing your visors, Karen wearing your masks on the airplane. But unfortunately, you do suffer because of other people's behavior. Shelley wants to know if I, if I still have antibodies, um, can I still be a carrier uh, for the virus, of the virus? So it also depends. Are they neutralizing antibodies? Did you get it during the first wave? Are they antibodies effective against a new variant? These are all confounding variables that we've got to deal with and try and understand. And I think that we would still say that you still can spread the virus. The same as with, I'll go back to that whole thing of Chief Rabbi Lau, who's mm. had two vaccines and is still positive with the virus. And there's your answer. 
you still can spread the virus. You know, he's still, he's got antibodies, but he's still got the virus, albeit lesser than somebody else would get it. And uh, Carol wants to know, where are we in the, uh, in, in this second wave? When do you predict that it's going to start easing? Well, look, I mean, if you look at the seven day average, the numbers have definitely gone down a little bit from the highest peak of, of 21,000, mm -hmm. uh, 22,000 last week. So it depends the next week or so, the next week or two weeks will give us final answers. Hopefully within the next two weeks, hopefully we'll be able to see that that, that peak will start coming down. We, we're praying for that. And if that goes down, then we can look forward to getting our children back into school and getting back to a bit more of normality and normalcy in our lives. And uh, finally, a few people asking around uh, the side effects of the vaccine. You know, every time something goes wrong, we are we hearing the stories, we're seeing it uh, in the press. The first question and the most important question is: Would you take the vaccine? Would you Would you uh, encourage your family to? So let me think about that. And the answer is <laughs> yes. Tick, 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 and tick. There's no doubt I'm going to take the vaccine. Okay. Um, there's certain vaccines I'd take above other vaccines, um, but I would definitely take the AstraZeneca vaccine. I would definitely take the Moderna vaccine and I would definitely take the, the Pfizer vaccine. Those are no brainers in my mind. With regards to the side effects, medication has got side effects. Certain of the side effects are anaphylaxis and we've discussed it before, that's an allergic reaction. That's why they say when you get the injection, you've got to stay in the environment where you had it for about 20 or 30 minutes just to make sure you don't get side effects. Some people get irritability of the skin. Some people get a dermatitis. There have been cases in Norway. They said there was and well, a general irritability having... because I think my wife might have had one then the vaccine. She means she's had the vaccine against you. Well, maybe because yeah, I'm maybe. saying with general irritability. So, so in know. Norway, in Norway, yeah. there was a report of 23 deaths post vaccine receiving. And these are elderly, frail people. And you can't put that into your subgroup of people if they're sick people, elderly people, that's not considered a side effect of, of a vaccine. So I'll go back to it again. I would want my whole family to have the, the vaccine in and over the age of 16. There's no doubt about it. My family, my parents, my, my sub relations, everyone related to us, everyone close to us, I would want them to have the vaccine without a doubt. All right. And uh, is there good news? So there is a degree of good news. And, and I think it's important to realize that, that COVID is a devastating disease. But with all this doom and gloom, we've got to realize that the survival rate is 96%. And only 4 to 5% of people are critical or in hospital. And that's very important. We don't want to be a part of that 4 to 5%. We know that. We can beat this. We just have to be responsible. We have to be unselfish and dedicated to the greater good. And of course, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the greatest football team in the world, Liverpool. You'll never walk alone. Big game tonight. Unfortunately, we always battle against the minnows and the underdogs. I hope we won't have to do that tonight. And to quote, if you make tough decisions, people will hate you today, but they will thank you for generations. Be safe, look after yourself, Stay responsible, wash your hands, wear your masks, and social distance. Dr. Anton Marburg, thank you. As always, this has been the Synthesis Sunday podcast. Uh, if you want to make sure that you receive these, please hit subscribe. Feel free to share the podcast with anybody. Continue to send us questions. We'll try and get to as many of them as we possibly can. I'm Howard Feldman. Be safe and God bless.